smaller bars. Did you bring anything? Oh yeah, she's ready. She's so ready. Yeah, uh, we um, I ran out of smaller bars, so I'm gonna have to use one of the special bars for you. You don't mind, do you? You don't mind, right? I didn't think so. What you bring? What you got for me? What's this? A shooting star. It's not gonna hurt me, is it? It's not like a shooting gun star, right? Okay. So where's the shooter? Does it fly? So what makes it shooting? What makes it shooting? You know, I used to, I remember as a, as a kid, we, we used to go camping, and we'd be able to see those shooting stars. Have you ever seen, ever seen a shooting star go across the sky? It's pretty cool. And it's a star that gets shoved across the sky, and you can only see it in the dark. See, I grew up in Los Angeles. There's not many stars that you can see out there, but we go out camping out in the desert, and you see all the stars. And the shooting star, huh? It's kind of like, what, what can make a star shoot? Here you go. What makes a star shoot? The tail? Actually, I think it's God's will that does that. That's God's will that does that. We're going to go into God's will today. Good job. Um, we're going to uh, continue our look into James. And, you know, it's James is one of those books that it's... I'm, I'm stepping up with technology here, so uh, I was I was gifted a an iPad. So guess what? We're gonna we're gonna step up in technology. What? <laughs> Little Washington? Um, James is is one of those books that, that convicts and it molds and it's it sculpts us, doesn't it? Um, sometimes we get angry because James doesn't play. James doesn't beat around the bush. James does not. He tells us like it is. Um, and this one was one of those that. That kind of spoke to me as well, again, a lot of the, what James speaks to me, because I'm kind of a blunt type of person. I don't like to beat around the bush. Um, ambition. It's all about the will of wills. Whose will are we following? Ambition is a lot of times I, I like to look at ambition as blind ambition. Because that's what drove me for many, many years that I was running from his call. I was going to get rich over here. I was going to get rich over here, but I had ambition, I had hopes, and I had desires, and I had plans. I was reckless. And the ambition doesn't change in your life. It just, I was once blind, but now I can see. I think those lyrics are somewhere. I was remolded, and I was remolded to fit his will. The ambition doesn't change at all. It doesn't get calmed down. It's just no longer blind. My wife is a planner. I'm a go-getter. My wife makes plans, makes lists of lists of lists. I plan on, I make a plan of, on board meetings, on what we're going to discuss. I plan on what we're going, what, what's going to be discussed or what we're going to, what, what the word is that we're going to look at today. So in, in, a, in a way I do plan and I have just as much ambition, it's just that it's been changed. We all desire to succeed. We all want success. Um, why? I think it's because the world tells us we need to have success. Got to take care of the number one, right? Be the best you possibly. Be all that you can be. Got to love the army slogans. The army of one, I think, was one of their slogans for a while, which that has never been more contradictory than in my entire life. The army has never been an army of one. If you've ever served in the military, it's never won. But the world tells us we are to be our success, to chase our own dreams. Looking into James, finishing up the fourth chapter today, starts off with verse 13. Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we will go, and do, go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. And there's a couple things. It is okay to plan. And plans generally include three things. They include a time. In the scripture it says we'll go today or tomorrow. It includes a place. We're going to go to such and such a city, a destination. And it has an end goal. The goal is to make a profit. Now one can say, well, this, is, this has to do with greed, right? 
Not necessarily. It's not necessarily what is in the scripture today, it's what is not in the scripture. And almost every source that I, that I, that I found out here agrees with that. It's one of the things that first came up to me, usually I don't see the way the sources are because I'm not that smart. Um, but we have, when I started looking, I was like, man, there's something missing in this. This is James, he's all about practicality. And he's not saying it's, it's not okay to have goals and ambitions in life. We need to plan. We need to plan with times, places, and, and have that end purpose, that end goal. But what he's talking about here, there's no connection. What we've missed out is his will. See, God and his will were left out. It's all about my way. I think one of the, one of the um, pictures I used was the old Burger King slogan. You remember the Burger King is, have it your way? And they even put it on the wrappers, have it your way. And that's what James is saying here. Is it, was, it starts out with this ambition that drives, that forgets the source. It's not bad to be a planner. What's bad is when we leave God out of the planning process. It leads to ignorance. And ignorance is not a bad thing. A lot of people think that ignorance is such a bad word. No, it's just the lack of knowing. But when we leave God out of things, it leads to the ignorance of what His will is. In James 14, James, or verse 14, it says, You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. See, the ignorance here lives in the temporary span of our lives. We're, we're just here for a moment. My, my, uh, my wife actually had a, an illustration she did with our daughter in the last week or so ago, and I'm sure she'll, she'll call me out for using this as an example, but she didn't know where I was going a couple weeks ago when she did this. And she was explaining to our daughter that, you know, we, we put so much importance on our life here, but we need to make the best of what we can do for him because this is just a moment in eternity that we're going to spend. What we do in this moment determines the rest of eternity. So we only have control over this one little speck of time. And James is saying here that this, we're nothing but a mist. The bait of our existence is so short compared to what the mist that evaporates. Uh, Matthew 24, 36 tells us, We do not know the day or the hour that he will come. Life, is not, is, life here is short. Uh, we, we, a good family friend who's been you know, a, a leader in the church in Florida had lost her father. The person who I replaced as children's pastor down there, her brother had passed away and they're from Guyana. They, they, they traveled down to Guyana, or at least Grandma did and one of the daughters did, um, to participate in the funeral procession. They, they have a lot of, it's, it's, it's different the way that they, that they partake in funerals. But while they were down there, their mother was a huge inspiration and huge support to my ministry, had a heart attack and never revived. Life is short. Life is like a mist. We do not know the day or the hour. And when we forget to leave God out of the planning process, our ignorance overclouds that. I remember a time in my life where everything that I, I could conquer the world. You couldn't tell me about any, me doing anything wrong. I was the one in charge. Man, I could, I could, I could take over the world. We are temporary. We are called for a specific purpose. And in our ignorance of that mist, we'll lose that specific purpose. Now, not, I'm not saying that everyone's specific purpose is to get up here and preach. If it is, I want to know about it because we're going we're gonna to foster that. Your, your specific purpose might be to gather people into the storehouse of the Lord from a coal mine. Can you picture me in a coal mine? I don't think so. I, I, I couldn't picture myself harvesting turkeys. I like eating them. I, I, I might not want to see that. I'm okay with that. You can't see me in a, in a hot dog plant either because I love me some hot dogs. I don't want to see what goes into them. I'd rather be ignorant of that, of that fact. But when we're ignorant of, of, the, of the Lord's will, we miss out on the specific purpose that he's called us to. Next, our ignorance and our exclusion of his will, it always produces results. 1 
verse 15 says, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, it is sin. Here, James warns of two different things. Two results. Boasting. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. I wonder where Matthew got not knowing the day or the hour from. It's the same type of temporary life that James was describing earlier. We do not know when our mess is going to vaporize. I remember even uh, the, some of those camping trips I was talking about earlier going into the desert. Um, we were part of the Royal Rangers. I don't know if anybody knows what the Royal Rangers are, but it's kind of like the Christian Boy Scouts. And We went out to the desert, and I remember watching the storms come, the storms would build, you see the rain coming down, and it should be over you, but it's not reaching the ground. It evaporates long before it gets to where I was at, maybe four feet tall. It's the same mist that, that burns off in the morning fog as the sun comes and burns it all off. It can stay around a while, or it can evaporate before it hits the ground. I remember the time pulling into Bermuda, and I'm always... You hear all these, these, these war stories and war horror stories of the Bermuda Triangle and how crazy it is and how things go. I never noticed anything like that, but what I did notice it was fog was thick. And it stayed for a while, while we were there anyway. We left with the aid of radar. We could not see anything. It was, soup, it was thick with soup. So we don't know when that mist is going to burn off. The next thing is, is knowing and not doing the right thing. To him that is sin. And it's a reference to how we live and how we plan our lives. It's okay to plan. We just need to put him in the center. We know as followers of Christ that it, it, we have to consult him when, when we go to make those decisions. What would have happened had I started looking for a church in my first position as, as, a, as a pastor and not consulted the Lord? I'm going to tell you right now, had I not consulted the Lord, I'd still be looking for part-time work down in, in Pensacola, Florida. I wouldn't be here. Knowing, not doing the right thing is a reference on how we live and plan our lives. There's some judgment that James is casting here, and we don't like hearing that word judgment, do we? Oh, you, you Christians are too judgmental. You're, you're too mean and judgmental. You're not supposed to be judged unless you be judged yourself, right? Well, when it comes to our family and our spiritual family, if you consider yourself a, a, a member of the body of Christ, yes, it is okay for us to judge you. It's called accountability. So James is saying, look, you know better. You need to keep him at the right, at the center of what you do. Because if you don't, it is sin. Yes, he's being judgmental. Sin separates us from the Lord. He's casting his judgment to fellow believers, not to those that don't. Remember, James is, is talking to all of the, the church scattered all, across the world. He's, he's talking to the church members. There are so many claims that Christians are too judgmental, but we can be. It's, it's basically to those that are not committed to a life of faith. I can't judge a non-believer based on what the Lord expects out of me. The Lord expects out of me the same thing he expects out of you, if you believe so if you're doing something wrong and you're, 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 you're allowing sin to come between you and, the, and your relationship with the Lord, it's my job to let you know. Likewise, do the same here. I've opened up my, that office door to anybody who said, who hears something that comes from the pulpit and says, you know what, Daryl, that's not quite biblical. I want you to come to me. I want you to hold me in judgment. How else will I get stronger? And we've, we've named the uh, men's ministry as Iron Sharp, Sharpening Iron. In the very first devotion, we, we talked about how what it takes for that iron to sharpen iron. It's, there's a stress on the, on, on the metals. And those metals heat up. Sometimes they change colors because they get so hot. So there's an obvious stress on those metals. But there's things that happen from that iron sharpening iron. You have a piece that was old and rusted and crusty, and now it looks like it's new. It has, now has a function. It has a specific purpose that it can be used again for. It reflects images. When you sharpen iron, it almost becomes like a mirror. 
So it, look, it looks good. It looks holy. It's clean. And it purifies. It cleans it. That's what we're doing when we're holding one another accountable. Not only are we supposed to, there's many places in the Word where it tells us to do so. I look at it in the way of saying, I want you to love me. Enough to say, hey, Daryl, you're messing up. Because it's my faith and what I do in a little mist determines my eternity. It's the same way if I hold somebody else accountable. I do, I'm doing so because I love them enough to do so. And we're called to love one another. I'm called to look at you as, as that creation that Christ has made you and I don't want you to separate yourself from him. You're going down a path that, that leads to destruction. But we're talking about these things that when we plan, we need to put him in the focus. So I want you to ask yourself if you're planning on anything, maybe buying a house, buying a property, so you can put another building on it. Are you consulting his will? Are you planning on a major move to Washington, Indiana? Consult his will. But there is always an answer. With, with James, just like with every passage that, that we've gone over, there's always an answer to, to the problem that he sets, that sets before our life of faith. Verse 15, it says, You ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. What is God's will? See, Paul, and I like to look at Paul. I like to look at Paul to support James because there's so many people that say that Paul and James are at odds. Paul is the life of faith for salvation. And everyone that, that agrees with Paul says, I don't like James because James says we've got to do stuff to show our salvation. So James is looked at as the as the things to do to, to be saved, where Paul is just strictly the faith to, to be saved. And it's quite further, couldn't be quite further from the truth, because James is talking about faith to begin with. To live on God's will, it takes faith. And this is what he's, he's talking about, is when we, when we start willing our own selves to do things, we've left him out of it. So we need to put him back into it. Instead, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we live and also do this or that. What is God's will? In Acts 18.21, you might want to jot that down. Paul was talking to the church, church, church at the Ephesus, and he told him he would be back if the Lord wills it. That if was conditional. Same thing in, in 1 Corinthians 4.9. He says, if the Lord wills, I will return to you. Time and time again, Paul was writing these letters of encouragement and correction to all of these churches. He says, if, I desire to come back there, but if the Lord wills. And we know from a lot of our history that a lot of those letters that Paul wrote, he wrote when he was incarcerated. He had no idea if he was going to be let go. Now, hindsight's always 20-20. He ended up dying in custody. But if the Lord wills. Coming here, my wife and I consulted the Lord for his will. We prayed before, during, and after. Matter of fact, the church board wanted to extend an offer that, that Sunday. And I told them, I said, when do you guys meet for prayer? And they said, Tuesday. I said, pray for it. On your faces. I want you to know, I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that this is the Lord's will. Not us living in the moment. Because if it's the Lord's will, there's no, there's no timetable fast or, or, or slow. It's his timetable. Something that me and the wife prayed about graciously. How do we find his will? And I love this. I mean, I was I was at this burden when I, when I found out that I was unemployed with selling pharmaceuticals. And most of you know that story that I didn't, I wasn't heartbroken. I didn't feel that gut punch. We've all lost jobs. There's that gut punch that you feel. But I didn't feel that. I'm like, okay, well now the uncertainty set in. What am I going to do? I'm sorry, how am I going to provide? And then all these questions started coming in. And so I went to my, I went to the Lord in prayer. And what am I going to do? But see, the circumstances, they just kind of clouded. I love how the enemy uses those circumstances. And he likes to 
whisper in her ear and keep us from looking into the right place of the Word. So I go to my mentor, and my mentor says, I want you to ask, seek, and knock. Like, why didn't I think of that? That's one of my favorite sayings from Jesus. Ask, and you will find, or ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find, and knock, and the door will be open to you. But you notice that there's in that way, in that order, we ask God for direction. We seek His will. As I see, talking to dozens of DSs across the United States. And I started knocking on doors. There's a lot of doors that were, that were answered and they were shut right back in front of me. Now, I'm not one of those who say, well, if God closes the door, he's going to open up a window. No, I went looking for another door. Because he doesn't say, look for a window. He says, ask, seek, and knock. And so I kept knocking. We are to at, seek his will. We are to seek it, and then we're supposed to be obedient and follow it. Seek it and follow it. Now, if we seek it and we know what it is, we're going back to verse 17. I didn't put 17 in there. Look at there. Back to 17. Therefore, one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him that is sin. So had I said, all right, Lord, you want me to... It's funny, we, we, we interviewed at another church in Kentucky the same day that we interviewed here, and I, I preached the, the evening service, and we were talking about how God's Spirit was moving in both places, and the, the pros and the cons, and the, the, the ups and the downs of everything, the hypotheticals talk, and, and Haley goes, she goes, well, not that I already don't know, but where are you leaning? Where do you feel led? Where's the Lord leading you to? You see, me, me and my wife, my, I told my wife, I said, this is my prayer. I drive into that community. They are not going to know in Washington or in, in the other town in, in Kentucky are not going to know that I'm there. Because I always get here early. As a matter of fact, I was an hour and a half early in, in Kentucky. I drove this town before we checked in. I drove it again. We met here Saturday morning at 11. I was, I was up at 4 o'clock in the morning, waiting on them to open up breakfast so I could give me a, a pancake or a waffle, whatever it was, and, and we just drove to town. And my prayer was, Lord, break my heart for the community. I hadn't met anybody, either place. My heart broke for this community. So I knew, because I was seeking his will, and he was answering. Now, had I not followed it, oh my goodness. But Daryl, you'd be serving as, as, a, as a pastor somewhere, right? Chances are I probably would be, but that's still sin. It's still something I'm held accountable for. See, we're, we're instructed to follow his will. The one who knows, knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, that is sin. I want us to think for a moment. What if we started asking those questions to our Father? on everything that we decide to do. I'm talking everything. What schools do we put our kids in? What extracurricular activities do we allow our kids to partake in? How do I counsel a child that wants to pick up a habit? If you haven't done that, I'm sure you will. I'm, I, I was one of those kids. How do we, how do we approach a situation that may not be the most comfortable. What happens if we asked, seek, and knocked? What, if, what happens if we seeked His will instead of our own? I think one of the biggest problems that we have in the church is people don't like the music, or they don't like the preaching, or they don't like how this program is not offered, or that program because it's all about their own personal will. It's not about the will of the Lord. <coughs> what if we started that and we checked in before we make our decisions? What if we checked in with him first? What if we look to the one who has all the answers? See, the one that knows what happens after that mist is gone. So we're about to put a lamp mist. He knows what's down the road. See, I was angry for God, at God for, for a year after the, the failed adoption fell, fell through and Man, I was angry. He 
didn't know, I didn't know what was going to happen with that family on down the road. I didn't know that Haley was going to get pregnant a year later. But it stopped me from being angry. Because it's all about my will. What I want. And before we go, what, while we go into, into prayer, I want us to imagine for a moment what it would be like if we all made the decisions that we face in line with His will and not ours, even if it's not what we want to do. If we're all on his page, what do you think could be accomplished? What heights could we hit when we start thinking on his terms and not ours? I have a mentor that says, dream God-sized dreams. Don't dream man-sized dreams. We're too small. What if we were all on his page? Imagine the unity that would result if we all followed his will and not our own desires. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that James wrote specifically how to live our faith. But one of the hardest lessons it is to learn is when we struggle our will with yours. Maybe it's the fact that we forget your will. We don't even look for your will. Our will is so overshadowed because we know what's best. Lord, we ask right now as, as we we come to you that you remind us to seek your will, and not only seek it, but follow it, once we're told. It's that obedience that you seek. For when we do the wrong thing, or we know what to do right, but we still don't do it, it's, that in itself is sin. And sin is what separates us. Lord, we have, that, we have that assurance that we sang about earlier. If we can just seek your will, seek your desires. Lord, I thank you so much for your word and the promise of your word. I thank you for answering those, those, those prayers that we offer up to you. We give you praise and we give you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.